Hi, everyone. Welcome to this uh, webinar called Family Medicine in Africa, Family Medicine in Action. Um, this is a weekly uh, seminar, a webinar that uh, we have, not, so, uh, not, not every week, but it's been a regular feature. Um, it's a great opportunity for us as Wonka Africa to share and introduce people on the ground who are doing some great stuff as family physicians. Um, we're really glad to have uh, Dr. Paulos Bescher, who's a family physician from um, Eswatini, but who's going to share a bit more about himself shortly. Um, so let me introduce you to Dr. Bescher. Um, he works currently at uh, Rally Firkin Memorial Hospital in Manzini, Eswatini. Uh, he's going to talk a little bit later about excellence in NCD care, but we first want to know who the person Paulos Bescher is. Um, Paulos, you can unmute yourself and um, we can start. Hi, how are you keeping, Paulus? Thank you for joining us. <clears throat> so, Paulus, tell us a little bit about Good yourself. Good afternoon, uh, everyone. Uh, uh, first of all, let me acknowledge uh, uh, Professor Shabir for this opportunity. My name is Dr. Paulus. Uh, uh, I'm a family physician working uh, at RFM Hospital here in Swatini. Uh, I'm a, a family physician and at the same time also I'm a missionary doctor and uh, uh, I came to Swaziland 16 years ago and um, I'm still working here and I think this is the first part of my introduction. Yep, no, thank you. So yeah. where did you get introduced to family medicine? I mean, you know, you trained, whereabouts have you trained and um, before you arrived in, in Eswatini? And what, okay. how did you get uh, to be? I, I did, okay. Go ahead. I did family medicine here uh, at, in, uh, in the University of Stellenbosch in Cape Town. And right. I graduated in 2018. Okay. Um, but I came, uh, I'm originally from Ethiopia. And so right. I arrived in Swaziland as, you know, about 16 years ago. Right. And I've been working as a medical officer here. And then uh, I, I was able to join um, uh, family medicine. Uh, training at the University of Stellenbosch. It was a great privilege and uh, I was uh, motivated by some people who, who, who already became family physicians. And uh, when I was there, they were sharing uh, with me about what family medicine is. Actually, it, uh, it triggered something in my, in my spirit and it's something that uh, I'm called for and it's something that I'm born for. Uh, especially as a missionary doctor, um, oh. my main vision in the end is to bring impact and reach out people holistically. So uh, I, I, I could find that family medicine has got all necessary skills and knowledge to fulfill nice. my spiritual and physical and ministry to, that I would like to uh, nice. uh, explain to other people. Well, it's wonderful. I mean, so you've been away from Ethiopia for the last 16 years um, and, <laughs> and, and you are now in, in, uh, in Eswatini um, practicing for 16 years as a, as a medical officer. Um, what can, what, how did you actually get to know about family medicine saying, I want to do this? What struck you is right at the beginning, you know, not after your training, but right at the beginning when you were first introduced okay. to it. So at the beginning, um, uh, as, I, as, I, as I mentioned, uh, I had some friends who did family medicine and they told me about family medicine. And then later on, um, uh, I had a, a privilege of meeting Professor Hugo uh, from right. University of Victoria. Uh, uh, who, went, who wanted to establish a family medicine course here in Swatini. Right. So uh, luckily I met him and uh, he started a diploma course in family medicine here in Swatini. And the very, very interesting thing about it is that I met him and uh, it was a time when I really wanted to do this course. And uh, actually I was not just a student, but I was also a coordinator for the course, became wow. a coordinator, connecting Swaziland and University of Victoria. 
and uh, uh, um, uh, I was connecting them with the Minister of Health with, the, with one of the universities. Actually, there is one university here, uh, uh, which, which uh, it should have been a medical school. Right. And it was uh, started, it was started by a church, a missionary from South Korea. And uh, I was very much related to those people because of our right. spiritual connections. And, uh, and, uh, and Professor Hugo was using as a platform this university to introduce family medicine. And by that time, I was, because of the connection I had with the church and the missionaries, and uh, I was found to be one of the persons who, who can assist uh, this area. So uh, I was requested to assist the church and coordinate this program for Professor Hugo. And then uh, I was able to recruit some of the students and I became also a student, one of the students. Right. Uh, and then I did my family medicine uh, course in, for Dip diploma course. In, diploma. In the so then you went on to do a master's with Stellenbosch. Yes, then I was trying to apply. Uh, it took some time, it was not easy to get this opportunity while you are working in Swazini. Yes. But uh, somehow I made it uh, and I joined the Minister of Family Medicine course. So after uh, doing the diploma course, uh, I couldn't see anything uh, except doing family medicine. <laughs> right, good, good. Well, that's wonderful. And how did, the, how did you manage? Because you basically did this, the course masters at Stellenbosch and you know that was a master's with you while you were working in Eswatini uh, most of your yeah. time so just tell people very briefly how you yeah. how you did your master's there in it's Eswatini really quite, it's quite hectic uh, mm -hmm. uh, University of Stellenbosch uh, uh, specifically the uh, Department of Family Medicine is a very well structured and very organized department and even if I am in Swaziland, I'm always in, con in connection with the, with the school. Every time we have a discussion online, on a daily basis, every module it should be discussed and we need to apply right. our assignment. Practically for me, uh, there's no difference uh, on whether I'm in, in Cape Town or in Swaziland, right. because I'm always in connection with them. Yes. We need to always uh, contr make a contribution and uh, there is a mark for the graders for every contribution that we make. So right. every day I'm in class and I'm, I'm connected to the school. And uh, in terms of practicals, uh, I do my practicals in the, in, the, in the hospitals that we have here in Swaziland. And we have also about four contact sessions and uh, I have to travel for two weeks and sometimes for a week. Uh, and I Once a year? Here. No, about four times a year. Four times a year. About four times a year. And I have to use the road and then I have to fly. Uh, yeah. It's about no problem. A seven hours trip uh, just to get yeah. into Cape Town. And I never missed even one class. And uh, <laughs> I was very much motivated and I was very happy. I never regretted for the money that I spent uh, for trip and uh, as well as for. Yeah. The tuition fee it was it was paid from right, right from my pocket, yeah. and I really love it and deserve it, and I really enjoyed it, and I'm very very fulfilled and I'm happy that I'm a family student, and I'm looking forward even to extend and further my studies if the opportunity comes. Of course, um, PhD yeah. next. <laughs> so you'll consider a PhD, I'm sure. So good. Well, you're doing some great stuff, and I think everybody's eager to hear what it is that you're doing um, in terms of uh, evidence-based treatment of asthma. And generally, you've talked about uh, NCDs. So just share with us. I think you've got a presentation. Perhaps you could go through it. And if any of the audience uh, has any questions, please feel free to use the Q&A um, button, ask your questions. I see we already have one. Uh, Dr. Paulos, I think people want you to speak a little louder. I think if you're also struggling, just uh, lift your volume up on your phone, but that's fine. Thanks, Dr. Paulos. Would you um, would you want to present? Can I share? Yes, yes, go ahead. I, I've, I think you can. If you're not, just let me know. I think 
it should be fine. Sorry, I need to stop sharing. Um, so let me, okay, go ahead. There you are. Okay, um, let me start from <clears throat> acknowledging uh, some of my fathers in family medicine and uh, like to acknowledge uh, Professor Hugo and Professor Bob and his entire team in the Department of Family Medicine at the University of Karambosh. And uh, Professor you know, Hugo. Can you just put it on uh, team. Palace, sorry. Can you just put it on uh, full screen? Yeah. I think, yeah, just below that, your full screen, yeah. Okay. Then it, there you are. Yeah, good. Much better. Okay, so, oh, that's great. So I'd like to allow me, first of all, to acknowledge uh, 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 some people. So my father's in family medicine, Professor Bo, and his entire team in the Department of Family Medicine at the University of Kalambosh, and Professor Hugo and his team. Uh, for being inspirational and instilling the skill that helped me to do uh, some of the things that I am doing today. And also, I'd like to acknowledge Professor Shirley, of course, for trusting me and giving me this opportunity to speak to you. So this was a great opportunity to meet him and uh, having this opportunity. So as I have introduced, I'm originally from Ethiopia and came to Swaziland for medical mission as a missionary doctor. Currently, I am working at RSM Hospital in Swaziland, which is the second referral hospital. Uh, it has got a bed capacity of 350 and has, more, has almost all main specialties and also provide primary health care service. And it has got also 20 community Clinics. So the objective of, of, of my sharing for today is, uh, is to share the testimony about what medicine, family medicine can do through a family physician and uh, the lesson that I have learned in this process of learning and practicing family medicine. So the background, as uh, Professor Shadow said, the background of the, the quality of quality improvement project related to asthma. Uh, well, is, is, as, as, we, as we know, it has, in any part of the world, the protein is not spared from the effect of uh, negative effect of the NCD. A total of 3,000 patients with hypertension and diabetes are being followed at the diabetes follow up clinic in our hospital. Uh, as you can see, I put a quotation mark follow up and with, with, with follow up clinic because I have issue with, with the with that word of follow up. Uh, and then maybe I would like to uh, clarify more later on. And the main challenge was the space. The space was found to be a great challenge for the total quality improvement, uh, uh, for quality care of the patient. So with this vision, uh, I wanted to establish a standalone center of excellence for incommunicable disease, which is uh, very costly and uh, is very beyond what we can do, but there was no other option except establishing it because the space that we have was very, very small. So for this, I, I, I organized a committee where I became uh, a chairperson by default. Um, so fortunately, my computer tech. So, Paulus, maybe you can switch off your video. I think your quality of uh, connection is a challenge. Maybe that'll help you to be better. So if you cut off your video, maybe that'll help you not to be cut. Okay, so uh, I think I'm fine now. So, right. and then while I'm preparing uh, uh, for establish.
Hello, Paulos. I think we've lost him. Apologies for that. Um, Paulos, you still there? Paulos, can I suggest you switch off your video? I'm trying to stop your video. Yeah, good. Just stop your video, then your internet won't be too troubled, and then you can continue. All right. Seems fine. You can continue okay, now, sorry, Paulus. Uh, okay. yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah, no, the internet connection is always a challenge, so just go for yeah. it. Yeah. Uh, at least to put them so off. While I'm waiting for a uh, big picture, uh, so I had to do something uh, along the way, so I decided to do uh, to deal with asthma, which was quite uh, a serious problem. Uh, uh, asthma is one of the top pain conditions, which counts for uh, patients to, uh, to come to emergency room to, to, because of uh, acute perturbation. Uh, so I, I said, okay, while we are waiting for establishing the center, so why don't I deal with uh, the issue of asthma, take just one thing at a time. So, um, so one of the reasons, some of the reasons why I wanted to deal with asthma was almost all patients, uh, all asthma patients are on oral medication, oral bronchodilators. So we, we haven't been using inhalers uh, at all. And controllers are, are not, have never been uh, the part of the treatment. So uh, you can imagine all patients, they just come to emergency room every time they have an attack. And one of the reasons for this one was there was a misconception among our patients with regard to inhaler. And not only that, or even our health professionals had some misconception, uh, which is similar to what the patients have. And there was uh, poor patient education and uh, poor patient centeredness. No research has been done in, in Swaziland, and there was no proper guideline. And even the guideline that we had supported the oral bronchodilator. So uh, the doctors had a very good excuse to avoid inhaler and to prescribe what the patient wants instead of giving what they need. So, um, so uh, during this time, I had a really great challenge uh, because I didn't have skill, skill that is required to change all this. And luckily, I joined the family medicine course, uh, I mean, family medicine, so which helped me a lot. So as you can see, uh, uh, family medicine has answered for most of his health-related challenges. So I would like to show you some of the process that I have gone through to do what I was able to do. Um, so the first thing is uh, the research that I was uh, trying to do uh, with the University of Stellenbosch helped me a lot to go through a lot of literature to understand how other countries uh, treat asthma. And I was, uh, I was able to familiarize uh, myself with evidence-based management of asthma. And then through this research, I was able to do a, uh, identify the challenges. So my research was a cup study, uh, knowledge, attitude, and practice. Uh, of asthma patients here in Swaziland, which really helped me some of the major misconceptions and challenges that the patients had. And later on, as we move on with the uh, family medicine, I was also able to, to, uh, to uh, I was able to, uh, to learn on how to be patient centered which is a holistic approach which plays which played which has played a great role in in changing these misconceptions that we have and then later we had also a clinical government which taught us that we are not just clinicians that we are also leaders and and they showed us the lead, our leadership role in changing our environment where we are working and then finally also i'm continuing with my research because um, this is very important. Maybe I'll come back to it later on. So let me just clarify some of the things. So is the number one, the research. 
I was able to identify the problem, so there were 15 misconceptions, major ones, which I, I was able to identify. And also I wrote recommendations uh, concerning that. Uh, so some of uh, the recommendations that I, I, I mentioned in my research was to establish asthma follow-up clinic, uh, switch oral medication to inhaler, and organize evidence-based national guidelines, and uh, assess the knowledge, attitude, and practices of health professionals in Swaziland so that we can see what is really happening on the ground with regard to our health professionals. And then the, five, the fifth one was uh, conducting training. So these were some of the recommendations uh, for my research. Now the question that uh, I have is now, usually I see people doing research, but most of the research, they don't have the owner uh, uh, in terms of implementation. We write research and we write recommendations. And uh, you're wondering, uh, I wonder sometimes, you know, who is the, co the custodian of um, our research? So the lesson that I learned from this research was we must be the custodian of our research. So if we write recommendation, we need to apply it. So uh, especially as far as I'm concerned, I'm the only person who can implement this recommendation. So I just started um, implementing it. So for that, one of the way we can implement our research is holistic approach. As you can see down, uh, this is one of the lessons that we can take from this uh, part of the presentation. So the most important beneficiaries of our research are our patients. And one of the best ways to reach them out with our recommendation is through partnership and patient centered communication at the individual level. Yet now I did a research and I found the misconception. So now what should I do next? So the next thing that I should do is, is to, to address those misconceptions through a proper communication. And family medicine has got a very, very good um, uh, uh, tools that can help us to approach and bring our research on the ground. So I'm very much grateful uh, for University of Salem, which proposed as the consultation scale, which really played a major role for some of the achievements that we have. So as you, as you know, we have, as a family physicians, we don't just diagnose the disease, but we should, we should have other two more diagnoses which includes the individual diagnosis, which is, includes patient's concerns, fears, needs, uh, expectations. These are some of the things that we need to look into as we approach the diagnosis. And then also the context of the patient. So uh, this thing actually is one of the, the models that blow my mind in family medicine was the consultation scheme. And I was really very, very much happy. And I, actually, I had a very great, uh, a good score even in consultation model. And it really helped me. And then not only that, also thinking about the family, which usually we forget. And this, this, this model has really helped me because we never, we never, I never thought about the family when I manage my patient. I always run to diagnose and then just write my prescriptions and I'm done. So with, well, after doing family medicine, my attitude completely changed. So one of the major in, uh, reason why I had some achievements in this regard was is, is thinking the family or involving the family in the case. Because I realized that the patient that is before me uh, was raised by his family who are thinking in a certain way. So the misconception, most of the misconception of our patients is a result of um, what their, their family taught them or the way how they raised them. So if we don't address family, in the, involve the family in the care, then there are a lot of things that we, that we will be missing out. So thinking about the family is one of the major tools that helps me 
to overcome the misconceptions and be able to attain now more than 2,000 asthma patients in my, in my clinic. And apart, apart from that, I also want to talk about motivational intelligence that's also another tool that really touched, touched and changed in my life very much. So uh, usually when we talk to the patient, we are judgmental and uh, the way how we communicate is not motivational. But after learning motivational interview at the University of Kellenberg, um, my, my attitude and my practice completely changed. So that is what actually I'm using to convince my patients to take the evidence-based treatment of asthma, which is in here. So one of the ways how we can bring our research into practice is by holistic approach. But the only limitation that has got holistic approach is, is we can have an impact just at, at, at individual level. But if you want to have more uh, impact uh, at a larger scale, then we need to look, look into the next slide, which is clinical prevention. So uh, the research helped me to identify the misconceptions, the challenges, and then the holistic approach helped me to uh, up address those issues using a proper skill of communication. But to bring an impact in a larger scale, another model which is called clinical governance, which is another model which I really enjoy uh, at the University of Cambridge, and they taught us in a very, very nice way. I really love this, this model. And it talked about uh, how to be a leader as a family physician. So we are not just clinicians, but we are also leaders to transform our environment in such a way that to be conducive both for the patient as well as for ourselves. Actually, when we become a leader, we create a good environment for us and actually we are helping ourselves and we can actually practice evidence in every medicine. So um, one of the lessons that we learned from clinical governance was clinical governance helps us to have impact in the larger scale. So, it has got three very, very powerful and beautiful components, which has got, which is vision, and then engaging and implementing or delivering. Let me, in, in the next, uh, in the next uh, presentation, you, you, you see what I'm talking about. So here, uh, I'm talking now about vision. So what do we, uh, I mean when I talk about vision? So uh, for me, the best definition of vision for me is vision is the ability to see the opposite of the challenges that we see before us. What does it mean? For example, now I have a problem. So one of the problems I had was the patients with asthma who are on oral medication with frequent emergency room visits. So how do I see this? So if you have vision, which means we don't just see the problem, but we see the opposite of that problem, which is on the right side, you can see the vision was, my vision was to see patients with asthma who are empowered and managed with evidence-based treatment and have a good asthma control. So the problem that I see, this is what I see. What I see is a problem, but instead of just being stuck with my problem now, I should be able to see the opposite of what I see in front of me. So, but between this problem and what I see in the future, there is a process. So this is where now we have a big challenge. So some of us, we are stuck with the problem. The only thing we see is problem. This is a problem, we cannot change it. This is how we should live and then we give up and we stick with our problem and there's nothing we see. That is one of the challenges that we have in our practice. And the second group of people are people who have got vision, who can see the opposite of the challenge that we see, but they don't like the problem. The third group of people that we have in practice is people who can see that who have a vision, also want to go through, through the process. So I want to categorize myself in the third group, whereby, whereby people 
to have got vision, not only having vision, but also be able to go into a process. But when I talk to when I talk about process, it's not, it's not as easy as I'm talking. It is a very challenging. So in that process, one of the most important things is engaging others. Because we can never fulfill our vision without taking others in the process. And taking others and engaging others in the process is one of the most difficult things that I have ever seen. So this includes our involving our colleagues, involving hospital management, and also to the larger scale, we need to also involve even the government in the case, which I did. So I started sensitizing my colleagues who were not completely interested about changing the current practice and they are enjoying it. They are stuck with the problem and they don't want to go through the process. But luckily I was able to convince my hospital management and they were happy and uh, to support if I am just pushing with it. And then with that support, I started doing what is right using the holistic approach. So most of the friends, most of my friends, they couldn't believe, they did never believe that I can make a progress or I can be successful until I pushed and continued with what I knew. So uh, I started seeing patients and in a very amazing way, patients start to be convinced and the number of patients who are on inhaler is gradually was increasing. And this actually um, created a question among the doctors, but still they were very resistant. They were very difficult. And at some point I, I was planning to have my own uh, clinic where I can follow and they couldn't understand me. I mean, they never thought that there would be, they can, there can be a, a follow-up clinic for asthma patients. And they asked me, what are you going to do with, with your follow-up clinic? And I was asking them, what are you doing with your diabetic clinic? And they said, this is also in one of the non communicable diseases, a chronic illness, which needs follow-up. They couldn't understand me. The only thing they know is just refill the tablet and send them home. So the issue of control, the issue of prevention and the, all, all other things are, were not the part of the practice when I started. And then as I continued uh, practicing, the rumors that started came, coming out and reached to non communicable disease department, uh, which is in the Ministry of Health of Swatin. And I was called and I was communicated. And they asked, they told me, okay, WHO has been uh, telling us to do these things, but we, we, we couldn't find anyone who is interested in helping us. And, and as such, now we, we have been stuck and we are very much happy about what we, we hear about what you're doing. So is there any way you can help us to do this? So this was a great opportunity. So I had an opportunity to speak before senior government officials about this. And uh, it was a very fruitful meeting and I was able to convince these people. And then we agreed to make a, a, an evidence-based national guideline. And, uh, and, and I, came, I came back. But when I came back again on the ground, there was a lot of opposition. Okay, somehow I was with the help of the hospital management. I was I got one room where I can run the clinic. But after six months, the other doctors they opposed and the clinic was closed. So, but I continued with my patients where I was working, so I couldn't um, organize a standalone clinic. So I hope now you understand what I'm talking about. I'm talking about the process that we, we can go through when we want to fulfill our vision. It was tough, it was really tough. Um, sure. But despite that, I pushed, I pushed it. And, and finally, I did also, I finished my research 
uh, 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 but I, because of the persistence that we had, um, it, it, it couldn't stop. So I had a vision and then I continued engaging people. So because now I have some people from the management of the hospital and I have some people from the Ministry of Health, because I was able to engage them, then now things start to become a bit easier because now the bosses also started to say something about it. So the resistance is somehow, it somehow was changing, but was not completely. Um, and then uh, uh, finally, uh, the, they were able to see the number of patients that are flocking into to my clinic uh, where I was working. So the number of the number was increasing, and then gradually they could even see the number of patients who, who are visiting the emergency room start to come down. So now at this time, I think they were in the state of ambivalence. So from resistance, they moved to ambivalence. And then during this time, they were started referring patients instead of managing themselves. So which was fine for me, it was a lot uh, to see all these patients that are referred from every direction. But looking at my vision, looking at the future, I had to sacrifice and attain all these patients. And they were able to see these patients being contained and being on inhaler. So this actually created some questions for at least now they stopped opposing me uh, or you know, um, fighting with me. Uh, they start at least now collaborating somehow in some way. And then finally, um, there was a time when now uh, uh, we, we need to do a, a national guideline. And then I was invited to uh, work on asthma and COPD. Um, very, the very interesting thing that I saw was uh, uh, there was no one who could join me. So because there were a lot of doctors who came from different facilities and everybody was sharing different topics like diabetes, hypertension, but there was no even one person who wanted to do asthma guidelines. So I was left alone. So I'm still talking about process. I'm still talking about engaging others. So I did the guideline by myself, the draft, and at the end of the, the week, we had to present the draft that we, we have made. So during that draft, um, I presented and uh, I defended all the questions, the questions they, um, uh, they, um, they asked me. And then one of the things that they were talking about was it is impossible to convince Prozzi to change their mindset. But fortunately, before that guideline, I was able to manage a lot of patients with inhaler. So they could see that it is possible. But the only thing that they, they the only problem they had was there was no, they had no skill to communicate and convince, which I really understood because even myself, I was able to do it because of the contribution that my, my teachers and lecturers um, have made into my life, and I'm with each I'm always grateful about. So uh, currently, um, I'm through going through all this process, um, uh, I'm able to find another room well equipped, and uh, uh, and it's running very very well. Um, so this will. This was the outcome of the research. So, so this is what happened finally. Uh, so now I was talking about vision, if you remember, and then I was talking about engaging others with all those challenges. Now I'm, I'm talking about, about implementation or deliver. I'm talking about how to deliver now finally the vision. So I, I was able to, um, Publish the follow-up clinic, which is a standard one. And uh, as you know now, there are a lot of follow-up clinics in, in different 
places and different facilities, but I just want to talk a little bit about it. For me, we have a lot of refill clinics rather than follow-up clinics. So when we talk of follow-up clinics, it's not just about refilling the medication, but making sure that we are not missing some of the things that might lead into other complications. So unfortunately, I think in most follow-up clinics, the so-called follow-up clinics, uh, they are not really follow-up clinics, they are just replacing where patients just gave uh, their medication. Uh, they are, we are just dispensing medication and we are not following up. Following up, I think it requires proper communication, patient education, and also to do routine tests. For example, a diabetic patient should have EKG, should have uh, kidney function test and stuff like that. If you are not doing in a regular basis, but if you are just receiving the insulin or metformin on a regular basis, that is actually a little clinic, which is uh, happening in our setting. So for asthma patients especially, no one is, is talking to them, no one is talking about cold asthma control, no one is talking about stepping up, stepping down, just they get their uh, tablet uh, three times a day, TID for the whole month. So they are getting salbutamol tablet, which is four milligrams, which is very toxic. Uh, and uh, they have been getting it for the entire month. And it was used as a preventer, yet it is a bronchodilator. So I should have changed all these practices. So the standalone uh, follow-up clinic, the reason why I make it a standalone is because I want to bring that sentiment and I want to change the mindset of having an asthma follow-up clinic, which didn't exist. No one could think that there is a need for asthma follow-up clinic. And the second thing is to bring uh, and to train other people to, um, to be a model for, for, for the country and also for, for my facility. So refill is a part of follow-up, but it is not the whole thing. It is just one part of the follow-up. I think this is one of the very important things that we need to learn. And then, uh, the, actually, it didn't take much for me to organize my, my asthma clinic. So I went through the different guidelines and I saw different things that is required by uh, an asthma clinic. And they are very simple, they are very cheap, and they are very durable. So one of the things I prepared was invitation paper. This is for a family. For example, I have a patient. I can convince that patient or maybe he's a child with a mother, I can convince the mother, but when she goes back home, the father says, no, no way, you can never give inhaler for my child. And he claims to be the head of the house, so she cannot resist. So what I did now is I will bring the family into care. So I, I have a proper invitation paper organized and I put it in the envelope with a stamp and everything and I sent to, to to the head of the house to come back and to see me. So usually I was very much shocked by the response. So whenever they get this invitation, they never decline. Even if they are resistant, they really respect. Sometimes I make also a telephone call directly uh, and I, I make the invitation, which did a very uh, amazing uh, transformation in my clinic. So once they come in, I use a full, the, the holistic approach and I communicate them the way I was trained. And there was no patient that comes out of my office without being convinced. And, and you know that in asthma, also we need to, one of the most important things that we, we need to look into is the adherence issue. It's easy to initiate the medication, but the issue of adherence is the most important, the key important uh, aspect of our treatment. So some people after going, they forget about inhaler techniques. They don't, they don't remember about the doses and stuff like that. So action, action plan is the most, the most important thing that I, I, I have. And uh, I made that one and uh, it really helps. It motivates the patients. They, I explain them and then they take it with them. 
So they follow that every time they come, they have to come with their action plan and asthma diary. And they make sure that they are still following and they make appointments. It's very, for the first time for asthma patients who are stable to come to the follow-up clinic. The train that we had was the asthma patients have to come to the hospital only when we have an attack, but they never come as a stable patient because even if they come, there's nothing that can be done because the only thing that we have is giving a bronchodilator tablet. So if you are not talking about control, then it doesn't make sense to have a follow-up. So that was a big challenge. So I made all these things, uh, I designed it, and some, some, I went through the internet and I tried to adjust according to my context. So I make action plan, asthma diary. Asthma diary is a very fantastic tool. Usually now, for example, we want to assess the severity, which depends upon on the frequency of the symptoms. And patients cannot remember how many times they had those wheezes and cough. They have a lot of issues to think about. So asthma diary is the best tool for that. So I give them, they have to pick. When there is a symptom, they have to pick right. If it is not there, they have to cross. So every time they come, they come with that asthma diary and it makes my life easy. I can think how many times she had those symptoms. I can think how many times she used this bronchodilator. That tells me about this control, and I can also, I am also able to assess the severity of the asthma and the response. And then that will help me now to step up or to step down with my treatment. So practically, um, I feel like now I'm doing medicine, which I never did in the past. So I, they have got also asthma card, which has got all measurements, the peak flow meters and the, the spirometer results, the weights, the height, and everything in, in all this is documented in every follow-up, it is measured and it's documented. Even if they go to another facility, they can show where they are in terms of uh, their severity, everything, the diagnosis is clear on the card. So they can go to anywhere and the doctor who is going to see them will have all information on that, about that particular patient. And then I have also uh, made history uh, initial history sheet, initial follow up. You don't just use any empty paper, but it's a very organized history sheet, which has got, which can give me the whole, the, 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 the everything about what I have to know about the patient in terms of severity, in terms of confirming the diagnosis, in terms of the objective measurements, the subjective measurements, even the concern. The issue there is a, 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 there is a line where I write the patient's concern related to 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 the medication related to treatment or asthma whatever concern it is there. So this sheet guides me not to miss some of the very important things. So I don't use an empty paper for the follow up. So it is a well uh, structured uh, sheet that helps me to not to miss. Most important. So I'm organizing currently a brochure. Um, I have also able to raise funds to get peak meters. I have five enough peak meters. I have two pyrometers um, uh, with EKG machine, and I have peak flow charts, my charts. It's very important. For example, maybe the, some people were asking me why the my chart in asthma clinic. And because obesity is one of compound from, uh, factors uh, that makes you our asthma uh, worse. So weight loss is also very important in asthma patients. So uh, I, I have a complete vital sign, I can say, that uh, uh, the BMI, the weight, the height, these are the part of the vital signs in my system. Sheet. So oxygen saturation, I have also white whiteboard. And there is a uh, there is what I call it a family corner where I bring the family together, and then when I teach them, I just take fifteen minutes or twenty minutes, and I explain it right in video on the whiteboard, and they really like it. And the fact that I'm standing up from my chair and I'm going to the whiteboard by itself, it speaks speaks a volume to the patient. So they really enjoy that session, and they come out very refreshed and very much motivated.
So additional achievements and uh, through the engaging, the engagement of the, the respective uh, government officials and so forth, uh, I was able to draft and also submit the national guideline, uh, and then the, which was approved by the Minister of Health and as well as the WHO, the local WHO office. So now from this year, oral medications are no more uh, a part of the national guideline of guideline uh, uh, Still, there are doctors still prescribing because they are struggling to convince patients. But in my clinic, it is 100% abandoned and uh, it, it is avoided. So I have it, uh, it, it took actually quite a long time now since I stopped uh, prescribing. So, and then preventers uh, were successfully introduced. We, I have some challenges. Um, uh, for with availability of the drug in the hospital at times, most of the time, actually. But again, I have realized that uh, involving the family in the care will help you to compensate what is lacking in the in the in the in the clinic. So I personally believe that every diabetic patient can have all that annual test if we are involving the family in the care. For example, now for children, we don't have spacers in the hospital, but all children that I'm following, they, I make sure that they have spacers. So one thing that I do is I involve the family. So for example, if I, the child comes with an old gogo who has no money, I don't look just look at her, but I look into the family. So I make, I make an invitation, I bring the people who are in the part of that family, and I explain, I convince them, and then I made them buy the spacers. So all spacers that have been given to children were purchased from a private pharmacy through uh, communication and convincing the family uh, who are uh, who are supporting this particular patient. So after the guideline, also I I was assigned as uh, a national uh, asthma trainer. And I've been traveling from facility to facility, training uh, nurses and doctors in the country. Uh, every time I do the presentation, it is an eye opening for them, and still they are struggling how they can implement and convince uh, the nation, in which I completely understand, uh, which is also requires training. So I'm requesting the Minister of Health to organize. Uh, a, a training on how to uh, uh, how to, um, to organize a training to, so that I can present on how, how to conduct those motivational interviews, how to convince me so that I am able to uh, share my experience in terms of communication. Because what I was training them was I was just training them the evidence-based uh, treatment of asthma, and by comparing the oral medication that we are giving. And it is an eye opening for them. It is now they are saying, yes, what you are saying is very right. But now the issue is how to do it, how to communicate. That is a big issue. So now, currently, also, I'm writing two books, and one is uh, for the patient, for asthma patients. The title of the book is There is Hope for My Asthma. And the second one is I'm writing a book. Uh, which the title is Pocket Guide for Health Professional on how to address misconceptions related to asthma. So it will be more specific to Swaziland, but hopefully um, it will help for some other countries as well. Um, and then the, the, the one for the patient is very interesting. I like it because I wrote it like a fiction uh, by taking the history of a, a, a family who is going to who are suffering from asthma, it's a narrative form. And, uh, and then also what they have gone through, which shows that through that uh, book, I, want to, I wanted to show them how the impact, the negative impact of asthma and what can be done. So um, it's a very interesting way to so like a fiction form, but very informative. Uh, it's going to change most of the patients and then what I'm, I'm doing in the clinic is also is there. So 
uh, if they get that book they, most of them they will be learning even at home before they come to the clinic. And then, uh, and also I'm sharing my experience with my health professionals on how I communicate. So I just put the misconceptions and then how I interact with the patient. So I write each step, how I communicate, what kind of questions I ask, how I challenge my patients, all those things is, is, is being is researched in a process. Hopefully in this year it will be published and uh, that will be my contribution. To, uh, Good. So, and then uh, as you can see now in my recommendation, most of my recommendation, my research have been uh, implemented. Uh, uh, so uh, uh, the issue of training was done, the issue of guideline was done, and the switching was is being done. So most of the recommendation I wrote in my research for my graduation has been implemented, so which is where I'm very happy. That's why we need to be custodian of our research. We shouldn't leave our research for someone to yeah. implement it. So this is one of the great lessons that we can learn. And we are because the reason is because we are the people who really understand the topic. So uh, the, the other person cannot understand and cannot find it really the way we do it. That's what I learned. Uh, and then one of, another recommendation in that uh, research was to do a, a cup study for doctors just to assess their baseline knowledge in terms of what they are doing, what they are doing. Where was the challenge? And, and uh, I'm writing a proposal uh, currently. I'm finalizing. I'm, I'm almost finalized, and I need someone to assist me with that research so that uh, I start collecting my data and analyzing that. Um, so, and then uh, I'm planning also to do some research in the future in terms of treatment adherence. What is happening with my patients? How many of them are still? Uh, on, uh, on treatment, uh, how they are doing after 20 years of treatment. That's something that I want to see. And then I want to also look at the impact of uh, the asthma clinic on, on the work. Uh, Looks like a mind. PhD there for you. <laughs> so uh, this will be the last uh, in, uh, slide. And I think this is why the, some of the process that I'm using. Yep. Uh -huh. And I believe that every family physician should do research. Yes. And so that we can assess our work environment, our practices. And then once we find uh, some results and recommendations, we need to apply it at individual level using a holistic approach, which we are trained for with. And if you want to make a, and the impact in a larger scale, then we need to use our skill from clinical governance on leadership roles so that we can have an impact added. And then after having an impact, again, we need to go back to our research and assess mm. yes. what has really happened through our holistic approach and uh, through our clinical governance, and then the cycle continues. I think I have to stop here. Thank you so much. No, thank you very much, uh, Paulus. It's uh, really wonderful to hear the, what you've talked to us. Uh, I think I love the fact that uh, you talked about vision is the opposite of problems. So all of us just need to rethink and we can all become visionaries. I think you've placed some really good tools. And I, uh, I think you've shared, like you've captured, you know, how you take simple research, simple problems, understand them better, uh, and then actually turn them into practice and really do that well, um, not only the individual patient, but at a population level. Um, we have uh, limited time, but uh, there's just uh, one hand up. Um, Mansurat is uh, wanting to speak. I'm going to allow them to, uh, Mansurat, to, to perhaps ask a question or to make a comment, and then we'll, we'll just come with a few quick, quick other comments and then close. Thanks, Mansurat. And there's a question also from Charles. Yeah, go ahead, Montserrat. If you unmute yourself, I think you can. Um, okay. All right. While you're doing that, Charles asks um, a question. Charles in some in some in San Zabera. Um, 
Yeah, no, I think Don Montserrat is busy. Let's see if she gets to be unmuted. Uh, Mons Charles asked the question, are you no longer using the oral drugs? Have you moved patients all across to, um, to inhalers? Yeah, that's a very good question. Uh -huh. uh, as I said, <clears throat> the number of uh, prescriptions for inhalers is increasing. But the issue is, do the patient take it is another question. Yeah, yeah. So uh, I, people are prescribing. All right. The number of prescriptions is increasing. Doctors are prescribing because of the guidelines. But the issue of communication is a big problem currently. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then me personally, I never prescribe oral medication and I will never prescribe uh, oral medication, especially now that we have this guidance. <clears throat> Yes, I think just to mention, I think um, Charles asked the question, what about combination of oral drugs? I think if you're looking at oral bronchodilators, it's kind of old, old style. I think you're probably using theophylline. I'd be surprised if it's Ventolin. Um, but, um, you know, this is 20 years ago that even in South Africa, I think some places they were using the evidence is now the side effect profile is high and, um, and they're not as helpful as the or inhale or the inhaled um, bronchodilators as well as the corticosteroids. So I think getting people onto inhalers is our choice. There's obviously a place for prednisone at some points, but uh, these are short doses uh, based on the exacerbations or the acute situation. So uh, I'm not sure that Charles, if that answers your question, like uh, Dr. Paula says, you really wouldn't be giving those, or those drugs that are being used, you know, these theophylines and Ventolin tablets. Uh, just, um, just, just to mention, maybe, maybe just to share some of the things that were happening because of the oral bronchodilators. Mm. As we know, when the patient has got a severe attack, oral medications take years for, for the patient to respond. So patient, there is a high chance that the patient can die. Yeah. Number two, if we take the, the carbothermal tablet, it is four milligram versus 0 0.1 milligram in, in when you are using inhaler. So you are giving four, mil, tab, four milligram tablet three times a day, which is going to be 12 milligram a day. Mm. Where as compared to uh, inhaler, when you compare with the inhaler, inhaler is 0 0.1 milligram. Even if yeah. you give him three times a day, it's going to be only 0 0.3 milligram. Yeah, so, but in terms of impact, also the inhaler, despite the low dose, it has got a very a great impact on the, on the patient. So yeah. uh, the reason why we are running our way is not just because oh, it is not evidence-based because it has got a lot of uh, danger. Uh, I yeah. Now, I think you point out an important problem. You know, it's not just the medication as well. I think you are addressing a holistic, you know, looking at a holistic approach, even in South Africa. I'm not sure where they, you know, other parts in Africa where they're using inhalers. But the other problem is that they dished out without patients being educated about how to use them. And, uh, you know, they, they don't use it well. And then the delivery of the drug is suboptimal and then they don't achieve control. So, you know, each has its own problems, but I think the direction is right. And I, and I really appreciate, you know, that from, from what I can see, you know, despite the resistance of doctors, and we all know that African doctors, as they're trained in undergraduate med specialist, increasingly specialist environments, are really not having the skills necessary as family doctors that we train in postgraduate to be functioning in primary care. And I think you've pointed out really well, firstly, simple clinical problems that they don't seem to realize, uh, like you pointed out, you know, oral bronchodilators that should be not used. And that in fact, you showed an even bigger problem with the guidelines um, not being there or up to date and that the evidence is not being brought to bear, um, which, is, uh, which is really sad. And I think that's a task of family doctors to say, you know, where's the guideline? Where's a national guideline or a local protocol based on good guidance uh, you know, globally? And I think you, you, know, you also as a family physician have shown that you don't just look for evidence, you know, in journals, you actually make evidence. You've seen a problem and you said, let me look at understanding that better and contributed to the, to the evidence, you know, broadly. So I think that's really wonderful stuff. But you as a, you know, you've also demonstrated this holistic approach, looking not just at the patient and the biological problem, 
but in fact, the psychological issues in that patient and the, um, you know, the social context, um, which is, you know, you really useful, like uh, Charles has said, he really appreciates the family in the asthma, because very often, this is the contextual problem, is that many times the family have an atopy themselves. You know, it's not just asthma, there's also the, um, you know, sisters got uh, allergies, conjunctivitis, or, uh, you know, um, a ticaria, um, or other kind of conditions, a fever, and people don't notice that. And then they don't look at the question of dust in the environment, and do that education. So I think that's, that's the merits of sitting and having a much more holistic manner. But you've taken it not just as I'm just dealing with a patient and being thinking holistically. You've created a whole lot of structured tools around this process, um, you know, which I think are really handy and they add the value that should be happening in primary care. Um, what I also think is really remarkable is that you, you've said, you know, I'm the custodian of research. I don't make research. I actually implement the results. I try to do something about it, which is quality improvement, you know, and you're doing that exact same thing. And I, and I think, like I said, you know, you, you can easily turn this into a PhD, uh, looking at the process that you're unfolding in terms of quality improvement. And I'm really, uh, you know, amazed at your change management skills. Clearly, you've developed strong leadership skills that have been honed in, uh, you know, in the, the course itself. And you've learned to use, you know, set up a clinic, what, some people might say, well, you know, you're doing your own thing. But in a, in a situation where there's so much of resistance, that is the way to go. You know, set up something that works, show people, and then slowly they come around and you've shown that kind of approach. You know, so that's how you scale up. I mean, very quickly, you'll be pressured from all over the show. You know, make this happen everywhere. And, um, you know, you're going about it saying, you know, okay, we'll do it, but there are, need, there are needs for it, training, et cetera. So I think... Uh, those are all great. I'm going to try to cut it short. I have quite a few uh, questions, but I'm going to, and I don't see too many other people asking questions. So I'll give you very brief questions and then you can answer it. I think you mentioned spacer. It might be useful to educate patients about using these empty Coke plastic bottles and in fact, using them as spacers instead of buying them. They're quite easy to come by. And I think if you make a model there, you can easily show them how to how to make those spaces and it can be used for adults as well as children. So that's a useful idea to share. Um, you've, you've set up this clinic and I think it is, you know, using, a, a, you know, opposed to the refill process, a very comprehensive approach. But have you thought about how you can take all this learning, uh, you know, you, you know about, you've done with asthma and look at integrating it into the normal clinic. Say, listen, not only asthma, but all the other conditions, how do we improve quality of care? What are your thoughts and your challenges around that process? Because it's not so easy, but what have you tried and what's, what's happened? Thank you so much. We'll, we'll try and finish. So, Apollos, we'll try and finish at quarter past. So just quickly, these few questions. Okay. Thank you so much, Prof, for, um, for that. Um, so because now I can see that asthma clinic is doing very, very well. Mm. So I'm also looking into other non-communicable diseases as well. So actually, I'm trying to integrate that one right. room into uh, other conditions. Disease clinic rather than oh, good. asthma clinic. So which I did last week. Um, yes. So I changed the the sign outside and I put a non-communicable disease clinic where, and I, I I listed out all conditions that I'm going to see in in, yeah. in that clinic. So That's interesting. for that matter, uh, for that also, I have organized all food that, um, which is which which is helpful for other conditions such as diabetes and hypertension. Right. So I'm organizing the history sheet and. Uh, good, good, well done. So you're taking that, this approach of a comprehensive patient-centered approach. Yeah. And you're yes. adding other chronic conditions other to try chronic. and, yes. So, I mean, I can see there's a, you know, you've got a logic, a strategy behind that, which I think is very worthwhile. Make success and grow on success, which is, but you have the idea that eventually it should be a much more comprehensive service, you know, being, being beyond what you've just done so far. So, I, I, I mean, you, you showed the idea of engaging as a leader. How, how do people responded to your leadership and... Are there difficulties and challenges that you as a family physician experience trying to lead change? 
and how does it work in terms of you know the t- the teamwork uh, in that context uh, <clears throat> Uh, it is a matter of time that what I learned is it takes time yes. that eventually we will get there. Yeah. That's what yeah. I learned. So we need to be patient right. and we need to appreciate the differences that we have. Mm. And I also remember my old days before I became family medicine mm. because I was in the same shoe. Yes. Uh, now I'm changed because of the skill and the, the privilege that I had to be from this yeah, yeah. So I think thinking about that would help me for, for not to be judgmental. Right. And at the same also to have patience with them. And at the same time, um, uh, even if, if they are not cooperating, collaborating, uh, the, 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 the one of the things that we need to do is we need to just continue doing right. right. And we need to we don't have to talk too much. Sometimes we need to show them with what they are doing. I think that will yeah. transform people. Uh, concerning no, lead, concerning yeah. the managers, I think I don't have much problem. They, most of the managers actually, they appreciate because they want to actually take the credit yeah. uh, of having such uh, a good care. Yeah. Uh, they are also listening rumors from different people when they go out. Um, they are listening about what is happening in my clinic. And well done. I'm dealing with uh, about 6,000 patients all in four hours. So wow. the rumors are lot. going out. Uh, some people even, they call me, ask my doctors and stuff yeah, like that. Yeah, yeah. So news yeah. are spreading. So <laughs> in terms of the managers, they are happy, but I have, I have a lot of work to do with my colleagues. And, uh, yeah, yeah. Work so together. can I ask you a quick question before we close? Have you thought of bringing, like, task shifting by bringing and, and building a team of nurses, clinical officers, and others to be part of your team in your clinic, in your comprehensive clinic, um, to show that this is not just about a doctor, it's about the approach? Okay. In terms of the approach now, uh, I'm working with the Department of Men Communication Department of the Ministry of Health. Right. So that sit down and talk and discuss about it. So the first thing that they suggested is now to train people on evidence-based treatment uh, of asthma, which was lacking. People, people yes. didn't have an idea about the evidence-based. So yeah. I think that is the first come first. So I think now that's where we are. And the next thing is now we need to see how we can organize formally a follow-up clinic in all institutions. By the way, I assisted one of the national uh, government referral hospitals. I assisted one department, the Department of Pediatrics. Uh, I went there, I sit down, I discussed with the head of department and we discussed with doctors and I helped them to set up the clinic uh, in the way that I'm doing it. So I, I shared my tools, I shared everything and they, are, they have also started doing it. So my, my, my vision is I'm open to go even anywhere to go to do this on-site training and everything. Yeah. I express my willingness to the Minister of Health yeah. uh, to, to use me the way they wanted and I wanted to bring an impact. I think that is where yeah. we are. No. Dr. Besha, thank you very much, Paulus. I think you've shown you know, how family medicine in action can make a difference in Africa. And I think that you know, despite um, what you are suggesting that people might think is indulgent, it works. And even the, I think the question of time uh, that you take to see patients, if you have a good team around you, the approach can actually save you time, save you costs. And it's not about, you know, doctors being costly. So I think that in Africa, we need to share this kind of examples of how family medicine not only brings about um, better access, better quality, but does that much more efficiently and much more costlier. So with that, thank you very much once again, Paulos. It's been really great to talk to you on a Friday afternoon. I think you've really been lucky to have such a large audience. I know that two, three, four months ago, we didn't even have anybody when we had it and I didn't advertise it. So this time we advertise it well and we're grateful to the 40 odd or 50 people that joined us um, on a Friday afternoon. Thank you all very much. Um, enjoy your weekend, be safe. And take care and uh, watch out for the next week's uh, 
um, interview with uh, Dr. Joy Mugambi from Kenya. I'll share that soon. So thank you all very much and enjoy weekend. Bye-bye. Thank you so much for the opportunity. Thank you so much. Thank, thank you, Paulus. Thank you, audience, for coming. Thank you. Bye.